Hi, I'm Jen Sandoval, and my pronouns are she, her, and ella. I am a speaker, consultant, and professor in Central Florida who focuses on communicating effectively across difference and difficulty. Today, I'm going to spend a few minutes on some very introductory concepts when it comes to moving from ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion towards justice. You get a lot of questions about how to define privilege, intersectionality, and also what it actually means to be anti-racist. There are so many resources out there and there's a lot of work that you can continue to do, but I hope that this gives you some things to think about and some initial perspectives and definitions to apply in your own life and also in your own organizations. So first we'll start with privilege, right? Privilege has been a word that has come to make lots of people uncomfortable, uh, even though I would say it's the nicest possible way uh, to describe unearned advantages that we have uh, due to no efforts or work or anything else on our own behalf. Often we speak about it in terms of white privilege. So I use myself as an example pretty frequently to talk about the fact that while I am part Chicana or Mexican American, I am white passing. So my experience is not that really of an embodied experience of a person of color. And I did absolutely nothing to earn those advantages. Privilege operates through assumptions of worthiness, assumptions of innocence, and those can have really significant impacts and consequences for individuals and communities. So because I walk through the world in a white body, assumptions about my innocence are much higher than folks even in my own family who do not have that advantage. Our privilege is usually something that we take for granted and often something that's invisible to those of us who have it. There's a difference between earned achievements and privilege. However, our privileges and disprivileges change the path that we're on to actually have those earned achievements. So there's an increase in number of barriers to actually reaching those goals for people who have less privilege. And then once we reach a space where we might have access to privilege or power, and certainly positional power, we should definitely be doing the work to keep the door open and change those climates and cultures for others. Privilege uh, is also really important to talk about in terms of things like disability and ability. The world was constructed and our organizations are constructed in ways that are not meant often for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, for LGBTQ plus folks, and certainly not for people with disabilities. Our organizations are fundamentally unprepared to deal with things like neurodiversity and also to change the very nature of work in order to be more inclusive here. So these are some very important things to continue to discuss when we start having conversations about privilege. Intersectionality is also a term that more and more people are becoming familiar with, even though it's hardly new. Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a feminist legal scholar, really initially coined this term when she was doing work in the early 90s, looking at the experience of Black women navigating the courts and the justice system when they were victims and survivors of interpersonal or domestic violence and abuse. And this was really to identify the ways in which there really isn't a hierarchy or a way to pick what's more salient from the identity of being black or being a woman. That it was the unique intersections of being a black woman, of being doubly disadvantaged in that system that meant something different for how they had to navigate it and the outcomes that she was able to see in those courts. Intersectionality should really be a framework or a lens by which we look at all of our policies, procedures, rules, laws, business decisions. We need to be thinking about what are the unintended consequences. Oftentimes when we're constructing that kind of information and language, we tend to think of a default experience. We tend to think of some things as more universal than they are, but we have to look at the possibility of 
triple or quadruple marginalization or minoritization for people across race, gender, disability, and other complex and nuanced identities. And really look at the ways in which our systems are not constructed for those lived experiences, and we aren't very responsive to what that can look like now. Lastly, anti-racism, um, really, again, not a new term, but one that has come importantly to a lot more popularity. And there are lots of, particularly of black scholars who have done a lot of work around this. And I encourage you to look at their work specifically to see the possibilities in terms of what this is. But one of the most critical things to understand about anti-racism is that it's active. Right. So the key difference that people have been pointing to for a long time is that when somebody says I'm not racist, that that is a very passive existence, especially in the United States, when we live in racist structures and certainly have been socialized into racist ideology, whether we have come to consciousness about it or not, that is built into the very foundations of the way that things work in the United States. So this is active, it's co-conspiratorial, right? We put ourselves on the line and actively acknowledge the structures and systems that are oppressive. Anti-racism is born in abolition. It is looking at the dismantling of those practices and it is looking at the, the places in which white supremacy is so embedded that we no longer question or have the ability to even see it. So there are some things that I think are really helpful to keep in mind to understand that. So Aluo wrote um, about this a while ago, right? And really pointed out that if your anti-racism work prioritizes the growth and enlightenment of white America over the safety, dignity, and humanity of people of color, it's not anti-racism work, it's white supremacy. And we continue to see that in a lot of discussions right, where there continues to be a centering of whiteness and a centering of growth and change and book clubs. And it is important to take responsibility for our own learning, but the public facing work, the true allyship, the true nature of being an accomplice and an active anti-racist is to make sure that it is looking at the very systems that take away from full personhood, dignity, and rights, especially of people of color. And this can be difficult to do because as we're often reminded, white supremacy is not a shark, it is the water. We tend to think of it as this big scary monster that's out there that will know it when we see it and we of course don't support it and we'll be able to identify it and dismantle it. But because it's so embedded in every system, in every process, in every organization that we're in, it becomes very difficult to one, identify, and two, do the work of change. So this hopefully gives you some things to consider, particularly in this work, so that you can start to identify small actions that you can take every day to actively be engaged in anti-racism, whether that means speaking up in your own families and communities when people are using language that is racist, when they're perpetuating racist ideas and ideology, whether it means changing the way that you recruit, hire, and retain people of color in your organization, whether it means supporting black business, right? All of these things can be small individual steps that we take while we continue uh, to raise our voices to change the overall structures. I hope that you will think about these things and maybe take a look at my video about shifting from allyship to becoming an accomplice. And if you have further questions about any of this, please feel free to reach out. It's important to show grace to yourself and to others as you're on the path of learning and unlearning. Be well.